Great. Well, I was asked to wait a minute until the recordings. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes? OK. Um, well, I, I'll just start by saying thank you to Ricardo and the other organizers for inviting me here. It's my first time at ICTP, and it's, I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to try to follow Professor Kang's advice from this morning and give a good lecture so I get invited back for the next 30 years. <laughs> So, also the, the, the words multiple equilibria in the climate system appear in the title of this summer school, so I thought I would give you a lecture all about multiple equilibria in the climate system. Uh, and I will acknowledge um, several people who are here in the room today that have been involved in, in various parts of what I'm going to show you today, including my former MIT collaborators, David Ferreira and John Marshall. And my student, Cameron Renkerel, is also here in the room, and some other folks who I've worked with who have influenced my thinking on these topics over the years. So I'm going to begin just with a, a few slides of, oh, I don't know why the letter B appears there. But anyhow, <laughs> I think that was supposed to say something like 60 million years of Earth history. Um, <laughs> And I'm showing you this and a couple other slides of paleoclimate oriented material just as a way of setting the scene a little bit for why uh, the problems we're going to look at in models are sort of interesting. And I, I want us to, whoops, I want us to look at this curve on this side of the plot, which is a compilation of, of oxygen isotope records from deep sea sediments. And Essentially what this tells us about is, is temperature of the water at the bottom of the ocean, which tells us about temperature of the polar regions where the deep water is formed. And the reason I'm showing it to you is to emphasize that if we go back 60, 70 million years ago, we're in a time of great warmth. This is a temperature scale here with zero Celsius. And the history of the most recent few tens of millions of years of our planet has been one of gradual cooling. So this has been drifting towards cold. And the other thing that we get from a record like this is this idea that as the Earth drifts into cooler regimes, and you have some schematics here of when the various ice sheets first appeared in Antarctica and then the, the permanent ice sheets in North America, excuse me, in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, as the Earth drifts into cold climates, the climate tends to become a lot more variable. So we have all this noise in this time series that doesn't seem to be there during the times of warmth. That's one interesting thing. There's a few other records from much shorter time periods. Okay, now we're looking, um, in this case, oh, oh I've got to get used to this pointer here. This is a record from over the, looking at some details of the last ice age taken from Greenland. Again, lots of noise in the glacial part of the record. This is another record that's inferred to tell us something about temperature. <coughs> the most recent part of the story, you have to watch how the time axis goes on plots like this because it, there's no good convention about whether time goes forward or backward. Uh, so that's why I flipped one of these, just so they're going on the same way on the same slide here. Um, Icy climates, noisy and variable. Warmer climates, apparently less so. That's a theme that shows up again and again in various paleo records. Um, and this goes back farther. Here you see this is a, another kind of sediment record showing the coming and going of the great ice sheets over these rel sort of 100,000 year time periods. Here's today, um, and here's uh, a bunch of big ice ages that occurred, and smaller, <coughs> more rapid ice ages that occurred before that. One of the interesting themes that you can see on plots like this is kind of prevalence of sawtooth sort of signals. Warming happens more rapidly than cooling. That's another, uh, we can see that in these curves here. It's sort of difficult to point both sides, but I'll try to move over there halfway through the talk. How about that? Um, anyhow, so last thing I want to point out in this whirlwind introduction to Earth history. Um, if we go much farther back in time, we're now talking about something like 700 million years ago. Uh, the continents were, first of all, as indicated in these schematics, largely arranged uh, in tropical latitudes. And a lot of work 
through field geology over a long period of time has revealed a lot of information about two periods in which there was extensive glaciation on these tropical land masses at these times. And through the field geology and through a lot of geochemical work and a lot of other kinds of lines of evidence, it's inferred that the reason these tropical land masses were covered by ice sheets was that, in fact, the whole planet was likely covered by ice. Uh, and this, we believe, happened at least twice. There's still some controversy over what the details looked like, but this is called the Snowball Earth event, or these, these are two Snowball Earth events. And here's an artist's depiction of what Earth looks like if you paint it white, okay? And that's gonna be a theme of what I'm talking about today, is what happens when the Earth gets partially painted white by ice and snow. All right, so here's a question, a basic question we can ask along the theme of this summer school is, um, is, the, is the climate system unique in the sense of if we set up the continents in a certain way and set up a certain orbital arrangement and uh, distance from the star and so on, is the climate determined? or not? Are there multiple equilibria in the system? We've just seen a number of, very quickly, a number of big climate changes that Earth has gone through in its history. And one way I can summarize all of that is to say that the fraction of Earth's surface that's been covered by ice and snow has varied between zero and 100% over, over the time that Earth has been around. Um, so fundamental questions. What, what determines the equilibrium surface temperature of the planet? Is it warm or cold? Is it a unique function of boundary conditions? And a corollary to that is, does a large climate change necessarily imply that there is a large forcing? Or can we instead think of some of these uh, uh, dramatic climate changes in Earth history as a sort of mode switching between, between different stable states? And if that's true, then climate modeling in some sense becomes an initial value problem. The climate we get depends on what we start from, and that's going to be the theme that I'm going to elaborate on today. So here's a, here's a sort of skeletal outline of what I'm going to tell you about over the next hour and a half or so. Um, first of all, some basics about this so-called ice albedo feedback mechanism and why it can give rise to multiple solutions, multiple climates, using very, very simple models, models that, don't, that aren't informed at all about our understanding of how the oceans work and how the oceans interact with sea ice. I'm then going to talk about what's special about the oceans and why the answer we get from the very simple models is wrong in some sense. And I'm going to then elaborate on that by showing various kinds of results from various kinds of climate models that point to uh, a sort of robust result that we can expect to find multiple stable climates in systems that, that uh, let's say, know about the oceans and how oceans interact with sea ice. Um, if we have time, we'll then give a little bonus discussion about um, the climatic impact of oceans in worlds that don't have any ice at all, which is another interesting topic. Okay, so multiple equilibria. A system with multiple stable states is a nonlinear system, almost by definition, a linear system. If we put in the boundary conditions, we get an answer. Um, to have multiple answers, we're gonna need some competition between positive and negative feedbacks. And the Earth has such competitions, and the simplest and most classic example of uh, a, a positive feedback in the Earth system is the so-called ice albedo feedback. And the ice albedo feedback, in essence, is very simple to understand. It's that ice and snow tend to exist in places where it's cold, and they tend to be bright, and so ice and snow-covered surfaces reflect a lot of sunlight. And so uh, they tend to remain cold because they're bright. Okay. So here's a very simple geometrical argument that will help us think about why and how Earth could slip into this snowball Earth state, completely covered by ice and snow. So what I'm sketching here is half of a planet, OK? with a distribution of sunlight. There's more sunlight at the equator than at the pole. And it's coldest at the pole. So if I have part of the planet covered by ice and snow, it's a cap of ice that looks something like this. And we can 
in very simple cartoon sense, talk about the difference in albedo between the ice-covered and non-ice-covered region. Okay, so I'm going to ask this, this stability question. I'm going to posit that I have some, some equilibrium state that looks like this, and I'm going to say something comes along that cools the Earth down. Okay, so let's say, for the sake of argument, we have a uniform cooling. I'm going to call it delta T. We cool the Earth down a bit. Because we've cooled the Earth down a bit, the ice and snow grows a little bit. So the line here I'm calling phi sub i, which is the latitude of the edge of this ice. Uh, this ice edge will move toward the equator. Then I ask, is that uh, a stable or unstable perturbation? And the simple way to think about the answer to that question is just to ask whether the, the two competing tendencies, which ones wins out? So because uh, the Earth is trying to maintain energy balance and it's radiating away to space at something, uh, something like sigma t to the 4, if I, if I linearize that and express the anomalous warming tendency from the fact that I've cooled the planet down, this number B here is just, it's a number, let's say, in watts per meter squared per degree that sort of measures the strength of that restoring force from emission to space. So there's a warming tendency that's going to tend to return me back to my, my original state. But at the same time, I introduce this cooling tendency from the fact that I've expanded the reach of the ice and snow. So what I've written down here is just basically this extra slice of ice and snow that is now brighter than it was. Okay, so I have my little um, delta albedo here factor, and I have a latitude dependence which expresses two things. One, the fact that we live on a sphere, so the, the size of this slice gets larger as I move toward the equator. I also have latitude dependence through the sunlight, which is this S term, right? It's larger here and smaller here. Okay, so simple argument. The perturbation is stable if the cooling tendency is larger than the warming tendency, right? OK, so I can go a little bit further and say I can relate the delta T, the overall global cooling here, to the local temperature gradient at the surface of the Earth at the location where the ice edge is sitting. So right here, if I measure the temperature gradient as a function of latitude, just sort of Taylor series expansion, I can write this like this. And so I can then write down a quantitative statement here for when my stability condition is met. So the ice edge is going to be stable if the temperature gradient here is larger than some factor that depends on the albedo difference between the ice-covered and not ice-covered region and depends on how much sunlight I get and depends on this geometric factor. So both of these terms here grow as I move toward the equator. That's the key point. We live on a sphere, so we can't get away from the fact that this term gets larger as we move toward the equator. This term, the temperature gradient, becomes close to zero at the equator for a lot of reasons, but the most simple one is that it reflects the distribution of sunlight and the, the gradient of sunlight, because again, we live on a sphere, is zero here and gets largest in the mid-latitudes, okay? So this term's big in mid-latitudes. It goes to zero at the equator. This is large at the equator. So it's basically an unavoidable consequence of living on a sphere that's differentially heated by the sun that at some point, if there's any albedo difference between the cold and the warm regions, that this is going to become unstable. And once it becomes unstable, then the positive feedback from the albedo takes over and the ice runs away to the equator. Okay, so that's the phenomenon that we call large ice cap instability. And I'm trying to convince you with these couple slides that we find it in every climate model that has any representation of albedo feedback because it's unavoidable, because we live on a sphere. OK. All right. So I can quantify this a little bit more, and it's worth doing. Well, I think it's worth doing, so I'm going to do it. I'm going to elaborate that argument just a little bit and introduce what gets called the Budico Sellers energy balance model. So it's a one equation model. Okay, the, It's an equation to solve for the Temperature, that's T here, the surface temperature as a function of latitude. So, so we're going to try to think about T being the zonal average temperature 
we're going to solve for the temperature gradient from equator to pole. Okay. So this is really just uh, an expression of an energy budget for slices at, at each latitude. I have a term that represents absorption of sunlight. Here's my albedo here. Here's, you know, S is still that distribution of sunlight. Here's a linear expression for the emission to space. Goes up with temperature, okay? You can think of it as sigma t to the four. Think of it as a linearization of sigma t to the four, but with numbers that account for the presence of a greenhouse atmosphere. And we have to introduce one more piece of physics here because we've introduced a spatial dimension. We can't avoid thinking about the role of dynamics in communicating energy from one latitude band to another. And one very simple way to do it, which is often invoked, is to introduce a parameterization like this. Okay, this basically, this is a, a heat equation, right? We, we, we represent the flux of energy from warm regions to cold regions as a diffusion process. Okay, so this, this gradient operator is just saying uh, where the temperature gradient is steep, the flux is large. And there's a number here I've called K that just measures the efficiency of all the motions in the system at stirring the system up. Okay, and that's a number we're going to have to in some way tune empirically because this is a parameterization of all of the, well, all the dynamics. Okay. We can write this in a time-dependent form, right? If we want to do a seasonal problem, we have a seasonal storage here. Um, I'm going to talk about steady state solutions. To this. So we're going to set this term to zero and we're going to solve it. But first, let's talk about the albedo. This is where we bring the idea of ice and snow into the model and we do it in, let's say, the dumbest and simplest way we can, which is a great place to start. We're going to say where the temperature is cold, the albedo is high. Where the temperature is warm, the albedo is low. So it's a step function. Um, this is exactly the kind of thing one could simply or easily code into the, uh, the ISCA model and get, and I hope I inspire some people to do that today from some results I'm going to show today that it's, it's worth thinking about. Um, so we're going to look at steady state solutions of this one equation model. It's now a nonlinear equation because we've introduced this temperature dependence into the albedo. It turns out, this is not important for this lecture, but it turns out that although it's a nonlinear partial differential equation, it's still analytically solvable by basically solving on the warm side and solving on the cold side and matching in the middle. Because it's analytically solvable, we can um, get all kinds of glorious detail. So the model then, solves for, these are somewhat complicated figures, so let me step you through it. Here's a hemisphere, here's the equator, here's the pole. What we're solving for is temperature as a function of latitude, right? This is degrees Celsius. We have an equator here at 30 degrees. We have a pole sitting near minus 20 degrees. Um, we've uh, encoded this, this ice threshold temperature into the model, so this schematic indicates the size of the ice cap in this particular equilibrium solution of the model. The other thing it tells us about is equator to pole heat transport. That's the other thing that's sketched here um, in an, uh, on in this axis in petawatts. So if you remember John Marshall's talk yesterday, he showed you many, many curves of pole to equator heat transport, curves that have essentially this kind of shape. Okay, it doesn't take much to get this kind of shape from a model. You basically just need the shape of the sphere and some differential heating. But um, what's, actually, let me skip ahead to the next slide. I think it's easier to see this way. The really interesting thing that we get from these models is multiple solutions, and that's why we're talking about it here. So what this graph shows, it's in a non-dimensional, uh, it's expressed non-dimensionally here, but this, we can think of this as the solar constant or equivalently the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We're mapping out in a graph like this where is the ice edge? Okay, this axis is latitude. And so this is a branch of solutions of the model that are warm enough that they're completely free of ice and snow. This is a branch of solutions that are so cold that they're completely frozen over. Okay. So we can find multiple states by just drawing a straight line through this graph. Okay. And we get these beautiful smooth curves because we have an analytical model. 
But let, I'm going to refer to this as a, as, a, as a bifurcation diagram or a hysteresis curve or something like that. I'll use those terms kind of interchangeably. What I mean by that is, and I'm going to demonstrate if this little animation works, let's imagine we cool our warm planet down gradually. This, this little funny little star here traces out the time history of the climate of our planet. If we try to cool it down and warm it up, we cool it down, we reach a threshold where it gets glaciated and then the ice grows gradually until it hits a point where we have a bifurcation and it grows suddenly into the snowball state. And if we try to warm it back up, we have to warm it up a whole lot before we can return to the climate we started from. So that's, that's the classic notion of a hysteresis in a, in a bistable system, okay? So this was the point, ah, this is the point here that we called large ice cap instability that I argued is an inevitable consequence of living on a sphere. And here it is captured uh, quantitatively in the, this one dimensional model. Okay, great. What else do we want to say? I did that. Okay, we have to see it go one more time. Okay, so because we have just a few parameters in this model, there's a couple things we can learn just by thinking about parameter variations in this same solution. And what I'm showing you here, I'm, I'm uh, playing with a parameter that controls that contrast in albedo between the bright icy part of the planet and the not icy part, right? So on this side of the graph, the albedo feedback is strong because uh, the bright parts are really bright relative to the dark parts. And here, we're on the other side. So we can think, for example, of a, a planet that's very cloudy. Okay, if a planet is very cloudy in both the ice-covered and not ice-covered regions, then as far as the planetary energy budget, whether there's ice and snow on the surface is not so important because the clouds are doing a lot of reflecting regardless. So we might be more in this regime. Okay. And what happens here is you see these curves sort of tilt over in different directions. Here on the strong feedback side of the, of the graph, this branch of solutions that represents stable ice caps, right, partial ice cover on the planet that is happy to remain the way it is, basically goes away, okay? Because this is tilted over almost entirely in this direction, if I put my funny little star here, it would go whoop, whoop, whoop. So in other words, the planet, if it were subject to some changing boundary conditions, would flip between warm and cold, and it would not find any stable states in between. Okay, does that make some sense? All right, we can play similar games with the other parameter that controls that mixing. Okay, this is a diffusive model, so we're representing all the dynamics through this mixing coefficient. And I've color coded these here so that blue is very effective mixing and yellow is very weak mixing. And similarly to that albedo feedback parameter, um, if we get into large mixing, or efficient mixing, we get very unstable, right? This blue curve is always bent over in the unstable. So there's no stable partial ice cover solutions in a very efficiently mixed system. Um, you can think of that in terms of if we stir up the planet well enough, it's isothermal. So it either has to be above or below the temperature that permits ice, okay? So that's, that's nice. There's interesting things to think about there. Um, and I'm drawing these pictures from a recent paper where we actually compared this to what happens at high obliquity where the equator to pole temperature gradient reverses and instead of thinking about ice caps, we're thinking about ice belts around the equator. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but that's an application of this very simple model. So to summarize here, Okay, in this, in this so-called Budico Sellers energy balance model, what do we get? Well, we get multiple states, okay? We get both stable and unstable um, states. Um, there's, a, there's a point at which we can't have stable ice edges any farther than a certain point. Um, here's a critical conclusion from this model that we're gonna challenge as we go forward today is that in no case do we have any more than one stable solution with a finite amount of ice. Let me go back to these pictures for a moment to 
emphasize that. Right? We, can, we can draw straight lines through these graphs and in some cases intersect the graph in several places. Right? Here we can intersect the graph in five different places. This region is unstable, this region is unstable, that's stable, that's stable, that's stable, okay? There's only ever one stable solution in any of these graphs that has a finite amount of ice. Okay. So remember that. Okay. So in other words, we can't flip between a little bit of ice and a lot of ice, but not fully ice covered. Okay. All right, that's what we want to remember. Okay, so what's missing? I mean, John Marshall set this up very well the, yesterday. The thing that's missing from this very simple model is any description of the ocean. And some might say, well, you know, that parameter, that K that represents the stirring of mixing of heat from where it's warm to where it's cold does include the ocean, right? The ocean contributes to the poleward transport of energy. So it's wrapped up somehow in that K. But I want to argue in various ways that that's that's a bad parameterization of how the ocean works. And one fundamental reason for that is that the ocean is basically a mechanical system. It's, it's driven by winds. And so it's not uh, always sort of in, enforcing a down gradient kind of mixing process. Okay. What I'm showing you here is you've seen curves like this in John's lecture yesterday. But here are some observational estimates and some model results for poleward heat transport in a present day like climate, where now I'm showing you both hemispheres. Here's the total amount of energy carried poleward. It has this beautiful smooth shape that peaks somewhere just poleward of 30 degrees latitude. And the partition between the atmosphere and the ocean. Okay, so as we saw yesterday, the oceans are doing a lot of work to move heat out of the deep tropics. There's disagreement both in observations and in models about the shape of this curve. Uh, the details of the partition are not 100% sorted out. But we can all agree that the blue curves are small as we, and we're in the mid to high latitudes relative to the red curves. And so we could say off the bat, we should assume that the ocean dynamics don't matter that much. Right? For this problem that seems to involve transport into the high latitudes and what sets the temperature of the polar regions and whether we have ice or snow, your intuition might be, maybe ought to be, that the blue curve is irrelevant because it's small. Okay. You happy with that? Should I stop? No. Okay. So, why do ocean dynamics matter? Okay. I'm going to just, I've tried to put a lot of pretty pictures and movies in today's talk because I know it's the afternoon and if you're like me, you're probably feeling sleepy. But this is just an animation of a simulation with a fancy kitchen sink climate model, relatively high resolution, bells and whistles. Um, this is just a kind of control simulation of a present day like climate. And you're just seeing the seasonal cycle slosh back and forth. And you're seeing the snow and ice advance and retreat seasonally. And I've got these polar views here that illustrate where the sea ice is. Let's look at that one more time. The colors in these bottom panels actually indicate, um, well, they're what we would call the Q flux. Okay, it's the, it's the monthly seasonally varying um, flux of heat into the, up, the topmost mixed layer of the ocean, uh, the net effect of all the dynamics of the ocean, okay, both horizontal and vertical mixing processes, the ocean dynamics as they're revealed in kind of the surface energy budget. And the reason I'm showing these is to sort of draw our attention to the fact that we have, we tend to have these big uh, red features right at the edge of where the sea ice sits, okay? And it's no, no, no um, coincidence, okay, that the ocean is pumping a lot of heat out to the atmosphere right at the edge of where the sea ice is permitted to exist. And I hope to convince you in various ways that it is no coincidence over the course of the next hour or so. So what I want to do here is answer the question of do the ocean dynamics matter at all in my favorite way as a climate modeler, which is to take them away, right? 
Um, and and there's, a, there's a straightforward and sort of logical way to do that, and that's to run the model in slab ocean configuration, where I don't change anything about the rest of the model physics. It's the same atmosphere, it's the same sea ice model, it's the same land surface model, etc. I just replace the ocean with uh, 50 meters of water, and I put no correction in it. So the ocean is just a source of water, it's a source of heat capacity. Um, but otherwise, the model is free to find its own climate. Okay. No Q flux. Because okay. I'm. I want. Because if I put the Q flux in, that's actually what we were just seeing here. As fact, this this is a slab ocean simulation with a Q flux diagnosed from a fully coupled simulation. So it has the same climate as the fully coupled simulation. Right? So what happens? So I replace a full three dimensional ocean with a pure slab. So, what's that? Permanent El Nino. Permanent El Nino. So remember that, you know, if I flip back a slide, right, what are the oceans actually doing? In fact, I didn't point out this picture here. This is kind of a spatially resolved map of the annual average flux of heat uh, in and out of the mixed layer. So if you like, this is the this is the annual Q flux that I would need to apply to an ocean model to get the right. Uh, annual mean climate. Where it's blue here, those are regions where the ocean is removing a lot of heat from the surface. Okay. Essentially, that's, that's you're seeing all this upwelling of cold water to the surface, which then leads to this big net surface heat flux into the ocean in the deep tropics. And where it's red in this picture, those are regions where heat is coming out of the ocean. Okay. It balances. If you average over the planet, it comes out to zero. It's a, it's a model in equilibrium. So if I take this away, I'm taking away a big cooling signal in the deep tropics, and I'm taking away a warming signal in the high latitudes. So I don't know, maybe we'll get a permanent El Nino. Let's find out. So this is just now a free running simulation with a real swamp ocean. Turning into permanent El Nino? It's some cooling in the South Pacific. It's <laughs> <laughs> not just clouds. So the gray and the white here is the sea ice. Okay. So, yeah, in fact, we have this tongue of sea ice extending right up to the equator in the, in the Eastern Pacific. There's a whole lot of interesting stuff going on here, but in broad brush, what's happening is the planet got a whole lot colder. It got a whole lot colder because the ice was allowed to expand. So and why doesn't it go down to the equator? Well, I told you yesterday, I don't know. <laughs> but, no, uh, that's, no, it's a very good question because uh, the simple theory that I presented at the beginning would suggest that once we allow this to happen, it should be, we should hit that unstable point and it should run away. It hasn't. It might be that if you run this out for longer, you might trip. It's hard to tell whether you're close to that instability or not. And these are very expensive simulations to do. So, but to the best I've been able to gather, it does sort of find an equilibrium that's summarized on the next page. It's 24 degrees colder than present day Earth. Okay. So the effect of ocean circulation today is a 24 degree warming. According to this, this is the latest and greatest um, NCAR model. Okay. So the oceans are warming the planet by 24 degrees. We call this the, the Elsa world and this the, no, wait, did I get that backward? Wait, that's Anna, right? My kids love the movie Frozen, so they gave me this terminology. <laughs> this is the Elsa world here. Yeah, it's very cold. Okay. This case of B case uh, also uh, with the uh, ocean, uh, ocean current uh, B? B. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. So, there's no ocean circulation. So, so it's a pure slab. So the, the motionless 50 meter slab, that's all we've got here. One is Q flux corrected to, to basically reproduce the, the, the contr coupled control simulation. Yes. Yes. 
Okay? How long does it take to move to the new equilibrium? Well, uh, the movie we just watched was about 60 years. So, something like that. Yep. Okay? So, why, did, why doesn't your simple, the first um, problem you presented of the large ice cap instability, that, that yep. argument? So, something is coming into play here that stabilizes this. I, I think it has something to do with. Uh, something perverse going on with tropical clouds, but I haven't dug deep enough in to figure it out. Um, you know, the argument that I presented would say that you can't get away from the instability, but I don't have a, 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 a fully robust quantitative prediction for where that instability lies. It always depends on the details of what sets the albedo contrast. And there's something going on here, whether we believe it or not. There's a, there's a, yeah, yes? You mentioned just saying that you can get this critical slowing down near equilibrium. So could it just be that this is a whole ice world equilibrium, but it's just going to take a long time to get there? Yeah, I can't rule that out. Right, so, so the idea is when we're exploring these uh, nonlinear phenomena in numerical models, sometimes we just need a lot of patience and luck because um, adjustments can take a long time. And with an expensive model like this, we, we can only run it so long, and then we do our best to say it's close to equilibrium, and that's all I can do. But it's impossible, basically, to rule out that it will suddenly jump into the snowball. Yes? From the simple model, as you approach the instability, the ice sheets That's what it would tell you. But it's, the simple model is, is predicated on this constant albedo contrast between the two regions, right? And that kind of goes out the window quantitatively in a model where the albedo is an interactive function of complicated cloud structures that are changing as the climate is changing. So, so we have to take that as a sort of qualitative prediction that there is an instability somewhere. We just haven't reached it here, okay? So this is really interesting and fun. I, it's not really the main meat of my presentation today, but it is my main argument for why it's important to think about the oceans. Okay? It's through their interaction with sea ice that the heat transport by the ocean has a very strong effect on the climate that we live with. Okay? And we find that out by taking it away. Okay. So where does the simple model fail to account for that? I said that oceans are not well represented by K times temperature gradients. And the basic argument is that when I turned up K in the simple model and I showed you those curves tilting over, transport is destabilizing the climate. And the way to think about that is that the transport is trying to homogenize temperatures. And so it's sharing energy from where it's warm to where it's cold. So it's moving energy over the ice edge. But that's not what the oceans do, okay? And they, they can't do that essentially because the ice is like a layer of styrofoam sitting on the sea surface. It's an insulator. And so in something close to an equilibrium state, I'm never going to find that the ocean is carrying a great deal of energy under the ice because it has nowhere to go. So some way or other, the tr circulation has to arrange itself so that the all the heat that's being carried forward by the ocean finds its way out of the ocean somewhere near the edge of the ice. And um, we're going to see in various ways models kind of do that. Okay? But we have to think about the structure of that transport, the spatial structure of where and how the ocean is moving heat toward the ice edge. So I'll take you quickly through work I did as part of my PhD where we wanted to address this issue. How, how, what's the simplest way to extend that Budico Sellers energy balance model to inform it about the spatial structure of ocean heat transport? So we kind of build a model that looks like this, right? Instead of a single slab with heat going this way, we put two slabs in, one that represents ocean and one atmosphere. And we build in this insulating argument. And we say that, the, the model is constrained that the transport has to go to zero at the edge of the ice, okay? And so whatever equilibrium we find is going to be one that sort of respects the fact that heat can't pass readily through ice. And then we 
come up with a simple parameterization. We think about a planet where the ocean heat transport is dominated by wind-driven gyres. And that leads us, through arguments I won't go into here, to another sort of diffusion equation, but one in which our K for the ocean is now a function of the wind stress curl. The wind stress curl through Sverdrup theory tells us, tells us how strong the tr mass transport in a gyre is. Okay, so if we know the wind, we can build a parameterization that looks something like this. So how do we know about the wind? And this is where we build this, what you could think of as the, the simplest coupled model in which the atmosphere and ocean are coupled energetically, but also through uh, angular momentum. And so we're going to kind of marry these two points of view. And the way we do that actually follows some uh, old work by Green and others, um, where we think about mixing of, of potential vorticity in the atmosphere. And again, I'm not going to go through the details. I'm just going to give you the flavor of it. But we mix potential vorticity as a diffusive process. And in doing so, we constrain the angular momentum budget. And a product of that is that we get this surface wind stress that we can feed into our ocean model. So again, just a flavor of what we're talking about. And this actually alludes to things that uh, Professor Kang was talking about this morning, that, that uh, if we do a column integrated budget of momentum for the atmosphere, then the surface stress, this thing the ocean is feeling, is, is an integral of the, the, the d convergence of momentum transport in the atmosphere. So if we have westerly stress at the surface blowing on the ocean, that has to be supplied somehow through eddies in the atmosphere. Go into quasi-geostrophic theory, that just turns into a flux of potential vorticity. Okay. And here's where we follow green, and we say, well, we can use a kind of mixing length argument to think about this as a diffusive process, moving PV from where it's large to where it's small. Okay. So we do that. We get a model that in schematic form looks like this. I'm not going to step you through any equations here, but just to say the reason I'm presenting this is because what pops out of this is something qualitatively different than what we've seen previously. So the model solves for PV in two layers, and so that kind of accounts simultaneously for momentum and energy transport, so we call it the energy momentum balance model, which is kind of an awkward word, but um, that's what it is. And the solution kind of gives us this wind stress that's westerly here in our mid-latitudes, and we get easterly trade winds that come up as a natural consequence of diffusing PV on a differentially heated sphere. Kind of neat. So we plug this wind stress into our gyre model, and we let the ocean and the sea ice talk to each other. We let the sea ice talk to the energy budget that the atmosphere is feeling, and so on. So it's fully coupled. What happens? Well, so now I've kind of rotated things around. Here's the pole. OK, here's 30 degrees, so the equator's over here. The two colors are just different parameter sets, not to worry about that. The point is that we get multiple states that pop out of this model. And that's why I've gone through this long song and dance. What I'm showing you here is a solar constant. So again, we're thinking of if we start warm, for example, we start with a hot planet, and for some reason it cooled down because the sun dimmed or the greenhouse gas amounts were reduced, what would happen? Well, we would get some ice, and the ice would follow this path. We ice caps would grow and grow and grow and keep growing, keep growing. And I've cut this graph off at the point where the large ice cap instability pops up. If I continue drawing this, it would go, well, it would go up, down to, sorry, where would we go? We would jump to zero, OK, jump to the equator. OK, so there's an unstable branch of this curve that would look something like that that I didn't plot, OK? But this gives us something different that we didn't have before, right? There are. If I go back the other way, if I warm up, I actually follow this branch. So what I've po pointed out with the one and two are multiple states predicted by this model. In addition to the snowball, which is not on the graph, two possibilities for how big the ice cap is. Okay. Remember, that's what I said was the important thing to remember from the simple model is that it can only ever give you one state, one, si one state with partial ice cover. Okay. There's only one size of ice cap that's ever possible given external conditions. This model has two. So what does that mean? What do they look like? 
um, I've just sketched out, again, these are very busy graphs, but let me walk you through part of it. Here's the equator, here's the pole. Okay, here's the temperature of the surface in the red solid curve. So warm equator, here's an ice edge, a cold ice top. Okay, here's the edge of the ice sitting here somewhere around in the polar region, 70 some degrees. Okay, so this is a sort of present day like climate. This is the wind stress actually that we get in this solution. And here's a partition of heat transport, total atmosphere. And here's the heat transport by the ocean. Okay, so this model, because it's, it's representing gyres, it knows about the curl of this stress, and it knows that here at this point, there's a zero uh, wind stress curl line. So we basically have transport in a subtropical gyre, and we have transport in a subpolar gyre. Okay, and it finds an equilibrium that looks something like present day. But then there's this other equally valid solution for the same parameters that looks quite different because the ice comes down into the mid latitudes and the entire subpolar gyre here is frozen over. Okay, so it finds an equilibrium where we have substantial heat transport in the subtropics in the ocean that comes into the mid latitudes, dumps all its heat out to the atmosphere and the ice edge sits here and the whole planet is a lot colder. See, we've, we've, the tropics are now you know, substantially colder as they were here and so on, okay? So multiple states, we get two sizes of ice caps. That's kind of the, the big prize here, is that by thinking about the spatial structure of how the ocean moves heat around, something qualitatively different emerges from these toy models, okay? Then we can flesh that idea out a little bit by doing things like, say I imagine that over some long time scale, there's an oscillation, right? I could have greenhouse gases coming up and down, for example. I impose a long sinusoidal forcing, trying to warm up the planet and cool down the planet. What this model predicts is actually not a smooth uh, sort of linear response, gradual warming and cooling it actually gives us this sawtooth, okay? So warming is abrupt, cooling is gradual. It's kind of interesting because that's a feature that I said at the beginning shows up in various kinds of paleo records. Okay, and the, the abrupt warming is that subpolar gyre abruptly melting away. All right, well, that would be an interesting, an, an interesting exercise in toy modeling and no more than that if I had no more evidence to present to you that this was a useful line of, uh, a useful way to think about the problem. But as you've already seen from John Marshall yesterday, We've actually found multiple states that have something to do with these predictions from this toy model in much more complex models. And so we're going to look at those and um, sort of start to build this hierarchy, okay? It turns out that the insight from the simple model actually was very useful in sort of shaping our ideas of what to look for in the more complex model. So I'm going to go to this numerical coupled atmosphere, ocean, sea ice, GCM in these very idealized configurations that you heard about yesterday. And I'm specifically here gonna be looking at a pure aqua planet. It's just 100% ocean, no basins. So zonal circulation as we heard about yesterday. And the ridge world has this one stick continent that goes pole to pole. The ridge world has giant gyres, right? It has a basin that the ocean can lean up against the side of the continent and so Sverdrup balance can exist and it can circulate in, in the form of gyres. Okay, so we saw some of these results uh, yesterday, and here's the sort of deterministic story, which turns out to be incomplete in an important way, that we can take the aqua planet and find, oh, it has ice caps. Right? You saw, I'm, I'm gonna skip over this quickly because we saw it yesterday. Um, we can look at the partition of heat transport in the aqua planet and say, well, the aqua planet doesn't have efficient ways of getting heat to the polar regions. That's why the ice caps were allowed to grow. And if we put the ridge in, then suddenly we have these subpolar gyres, which do provide this conduit for energy to get into the high latitudes, and it's warm as a result. Okay, but they're not unique. And so the deterministic story is a nice story, but it uh, is a little bit misleading. So, We'll talk about the details of the model offline if, for those who are interested, but let's look at this 
Uh, Let's look at this animation. So what I'm going to do now, this is you're going to look at results from a simulation now with this ridge world model that's going to start in a warm climate. And this graph down here is temperature, surface temperature in this ridge world uh, on this color scale in degrees Celsius. And this is sea ice here. There is no sea ice at time zero. Okay? And we're going to see some cross sections here of half of the ocean. This is the equator and the pole. And the experiment here is to do sort of like I was describing in a toy model, is to turn down the sun gradually and then brighten it back up. So I'm going to try to cool down the planet by turning down the sun and then warm it back up. So when it gets back here at 4,000 years, the parameter will be back to where it started. So we're warm and we're going to try to cool it down. takes a while to really get going, but okay, so we've undergone a very dramatic climate change. And at 4,000 years, the climate is cold and the ice cap is large, right? We warm it up again, eventually we melt the ice. I think this will loop for us. If it doesn't, I'll start it again. Okay, so let's see it again. And the, the forcing here is deliberately slow and long enough that we can think of, of it being well separated from most of the internal time scales of the system. So, um, it's quite a small force. Yeah, so I have some plots later in the talk that will be better to look at to talk about that question. But yeah, it's, it's a small force. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's large when we compare it to well, let's, let's call this a, a couple of doublings of CO2, something like that. We get fresh water in pools, right? Yeah. Yeah, so we see salinity, and, 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 and yes, as the ice advances, we get this salt stratification that shows up. So we get these layers of, of, of relatively cold fresh water that's buoyant under the ice. So there's all kinds of interesting dynamics going on. Um, the contours here are, are the overturning. Okay, so this is, well, it's a residual overturning, but it tells us something about um, the strength of the, the mass flux in the ocean. These are temperature contours, of course, in the, in the gray. Okay. Yeah? Just out of interest, is the time scale of the forcing very long compared to the other processes in the model? In other words, if you change that scale from 8,000 to 16,000 yeah. years, would it effectively look the same animation? I think I have some plots that address your question pretty directly. Um, this is just barely long enough that it's pretty well separated from most of the internal dynamics is, I think, the right answer. Um, yeah, that was the challenge here. Was, uh, it was deliberately chosen to be long, but of course constrained because these are pretty lengthy calculations to do. So even with a relatively coarse resolution GCM like this, um, doing 8,000 years of simulation takes a while. Um, okay. All right. So my reason for showing you this is, well, just because it's a neat animation and it has a lot of food for thought. But it's a basic demonstration that the model is bistable, right? Because when I get back to 4,000 years, I've gone to a completely different climate. So uh, I'm gonna, not going to say too more about that. I think that there's... David Ferrer I will give a lecture tomorrow where he's going to say more about related work and he's going to go into more detail about the dynamics. Um, this, these results were written up in a paper involving all three of us a few years ago. And um, the basic cartoon idea here, we have two stable states of the model. And much like I was describing in the toy model that I went through earlier, we can describe our cold state here as one in which the ice cap sort of advances right to the point where all the heat has been dumped out of the ocean. And the reason that the ocean heat transport sort of looks the way it does is that it's strongly constrained by the winds. And this cartoon is a cartoon of an overturning circulation that's essentially forced by trade winds blowing over the subtropical oceans that are pushing this warm water toward the poles and being subducted and returning. And this shape is basically very hard to get away from when we have winds blowing over an ocean. And so it shows up in similar ways, actually, in both the ridge world and the aqua planet. We get essentially the, qualitatively the same behavior. 
So cold state has a big ice cap that extends to the point where this transport drops to zero. Okay. All right. I think what's next? Mm. Oh, we're not going to do that section. Okay. Well, here's my argument in, in, in cartoon equation form. And all the ingredients for multiple states are we need to have spatial structure in the ocean heat transport. We need to uh, acknowledge the fact that the ice is an insulator at the sea surface, and so the ocean can't be carrying heat under this ice cap. And we need wind to give us this spatial structure. We put those ingredients together in both this toy model and a complex numerical model, and we get these multiple states. Okay. So let's take a five minute break, and then I'm going to come back and tell you, is that all right? We take five minutes, and then I'm going to, I'm going to take apart the model a little bit in order to sort of understand a bit more this interaction between the ocean heat transport, the ice, and the global climate. Okay. So complicated uh, is, the, is an ice model, the sea ice model.